Okay, so we're continuing on. We're almost done with Bir Kavot. We started over a little over a year ago. We're holding the Perek Shishi, the additional Perek that is really more of a Braita that was added to Bir Kavot. It deals with Kinyana Torah, the acquisition of Torah, a very important Perek that describes to us not only the value, the importance of Torah, but how to go about acquiring it. As we will see today in the second half of this long Mishnah that we have been doing, even if uh, an individual is not very knowledgeable, very learning, learned in Torah, he is still able to have an important chilek, an important share of the Torah. And by having a share in the Torah, he is immensely rewarded not only in Olam Abba, but even in Olam Azeh. There are some great benefits to learning Torah, other than the mitzvah other than just being Jewish and identifying ourselves with the Torah as our heritage, is actually a tremendous uh, amount to gain from regular learning the Torah. So this long Mishnah, even though it's, it's divided in, in several parts, contains a long list, that we said, of 48 uh, steps or levels that one can go through to reach the pinnacle, the height of Torah, which is really the Torah Lishma, Torah for its real sake, the purity of Torah uh, is gained when one really goes through the steps and elevates himself, consequently, in learning the Torah. He elevates himself spiritually, he elevates himself in a sense that he becomes closer to God, he elevates himself in the sense that he acquires many, many attributes or many virtues that he would not be able to get elsewhere. It is a, you can, I guess you can call it a tremendous exercise, spiritual exercise, and a tremendous achievement if one actually does so. But there's another way to look at it. We say that the Torah is like, in some ways like the keter, the crown of Kehunah and Malchut, where there are certain requirements to be able to, to be a Kohen, to be able to be a king. So in this same way, here it's not only levels that are attained, in some ways many of these are requirements. In other words, unless you go through this, unless one actually uh, abides by certain conditions, he would not be able to progress. So there is progress, and progress in Torah is measurable. And this is an incredible uh, Mishnah in that it delineates to us the actual progress that takes place in an individual. An incredible uh, description of, of uh, an individual that if we were to see this in actual life it would be incredible, but this exists. As we began to explain last week and the weeks before, this is something that is feasible, it can be done. And it, uh, it, it's a good thing that we are learning it, not everybody learns it in depth and you know they just rush through it it's a long list and you know nice uh, virtues but if you actually analyze each one you will you will see how each one is really important how it adds to our understanding of the makeup of the human being what the human being is really capable of uh, non-jews are also capable by the way of great achievements however there's nothing to anchor them there's, there's not that much to motivate them, unless it's coming from the divine source. That's the one big difference between the Torah motivating us, guiding us, showing us the derech, which is not fallible, as opposed to uh, a human being, man-made doctrines, uh, exercise book. You know how many books there are on exercise, how to lose weight? Who's to say which one is right? This one says don't eat, this one says yes. You could eat, but do this, but eat that. You know, it's man-made, it's based on people's experience, and they're not all necessarily accurate. Here we have the Torah. This is the Torah, this is uh, coming from Shammai. So obviously we can rely on what it says here. So therefore this last perek, and we have just a little bit left for, for next week, is a perek that elevates the status of Torah. In a sense, it tells us that besides all the good advice that we've been learning in Pirkei Avot, the ethics and the morals, the proper conduct in life, 
don't forget about the essence of everything, and that is the mitzvot and the ma'asim, the kiyum ha-mitzvot, meaning that ultimately knowledge is great, but actions and deeds are, are what really matter and what really count. Having a good heart and not putting it to practice is worthless. So a person may refine his character, may acquire all kinds of good qualities, but ultimately what will really be the judge is how he behaves, how he interacts with people, what he does with all that he has learned. And that's what this chapter really tells us basically is, in, in a sense, to properly conduct yourself according to the Torah standards, this is what you need to follow. All right. So we left off with Ohevet HaTochachot. Ohevet HaTochachot means a person who likes or who appreciates rebuke. Most people don't like rebuke. <laughs> they don't like to be criticized. That's human nature. You know, we are, I guess the word for it is, you know, somewhat fearful of being told off. Uh, we are uh, conscious about certain things that we may or may not admit. So n nobody really reacts very well to criticism, at least not initially. Unless he's very mature, unless he's calm and composed, then perhaps he can take it a little bit better. An individual who is on the level quite high level already of, of Torah. I'm assuming it's already a high level because we have already gone through the earlier levels. So this one is a higher level. At some point, he's not only tolerant of Tochacha, he actually likes it, he appreciates it, he wants it. He wants to be told what's wrong with what he's done, what's wrong with what he said, what faults does he still have. So look at the point that this individual has reached, or look at the individual who is very, very much absorbed with Torah. He is actually someone who is looking forward to being told uh, by another individual, who, as long as that other individual is, of course, sincere. Now tell me, what else do I need to fix? Ohevet atochachot. As Shalom Melech tells us in Mishlei, Ocheach lechacham v'yehaveka. If you give rebuke to a chacham, to a real chacham, he'll actually like you for it. If he doesn't, he's not a chacham. That's what he's telling you. If he yells back, he tells you you don't know what you're talking about. You can see from the tone of the response whether he's a chacham or he's a let's. A let's is a mocker, a clown, not a serious individual. So in some ways, you can actually test it out. <laughs> you can try it out, but be careful, right? It, it has to really be <coughs> sincere rebuke. The reason why it's important that it be sincere is because you, not only don't you want to just tease people, you want your words to be effective. You want to impress someone. You want, you want to be helpful. So if your words are not going to be helpful, you just want to tease, then obviously you're not going to get anywhere. But if it's true, what you are pointing out to someone is valid, and that individual is a haham, he should accept it. No problems, no questions asked. So Hevet HaTochachot is a very important level in the progress that I mentioned earlier in the continuous progress that one wants to make in growing, in maturing spiritually, is that at some point he needs to be accepting of criticism. Not only accepting, but actually asking for it and uh, looking for all ways constantly to perfect himself. However, tatochachot could also apply to giving it to others, not only for himself, but giving tochacha, giving musar to others. An individual who is trying to perfect himself, believe it or not, perfection doesn't mean just focus on yourself. It means try to help others too. One who wants to be perfect, wants to live in a perfect world. He wants the whole world to be as, as good as possible. So if he has any whatsoever influence over those who are around him, he would definitely have, an, hopefully, an interest in, in their well-being. And he would make an effort to give them tochacha, to give them musar, whether it's his kids who supposedly he loves, right? But real tochacha, tochacha that's coming from the heart that is constructive to one's spouse, to one's neighbors, to one's relatives. 
So the the desire to perfect oneself should also include the desire to help others perfect themselves as well. Now, there is one c- important condition before you give tochacha to somebody else. Yes, the Torah tells us, okay, okay, it amitech, so in some ways it's a mitzvah. It's not only a good idea, it's not only important, it's a mitzvah. If you see something wrong that you perhaps can correct, go ahead and do something about it. But the Torah tells us in various words, be careful. Be careful that you do it sincerely. Don't hate your brother, which has various interpretations. What it means not to hate. In other words, don't keep it inside. Verbalize it. That was one interpretation we said if you have something against someone. Another interpretation is don't embarrass him in public, of course. You've got to know how to criticize him. So don't do it in a way that you will end up hating him. But another important idea that is not, ex- is not clearly seen in the Torah, but the rabbis emphasize is that before you criticize, kshot atzmecha, make sure that you adorn yourself before you adorn others. Adorns means you want to beautify someone, you want to perfect someone, you want to make him look good, you want to correct him. Well, make sure that you yourself in that particular area that you're talking about, you're okay yourself. If you tell somebody don't do something and you yourself are doing it, what, it doesn't look good. Not only does it look good, your words are not going to be effective. Imagine a father telling his son, why don't you go pray in shul? Daddy, you don't go to pray. So what did you just accomplish? So if you're going to give Musan, you want to make sure not only that it's badinut, not only that it's gently, not only that it's done right, not only that it's sincere, but that you yourself are, are okay with it. As I may have told you once a story with a, a rabbi, a judge, who heard from an, an individual that tomorrow he wants to come to, to the bed day to see him. He says, what's the case going to be about? He says, well, I have a neighbor whose tree uh, is uh, trespassing into my yard, basically. It's uh, growing into my yard, the branches, it's disturbing. And I, I, you know, if he doesn't want to cut it, then I'm going to cut it. That, that's what it has to do with. You know, does he have a right to just let it grow like that? So that's what the case was going to be about. The rabbi heard the case, and he immediately told his gabai, his helper, to go chop one of his trees. He had, rabbi also had a tree in his yard, and the branches were also growing and were sticking out in the street, not into somebody else's, you know yard. All right. So the Gabai immediately took care of the rabbi's tree. The next day, Reuven and Shimon appear in Bedin. Reuven is the one that's complaining. Shimon is the one that has the tree coming into the yard of Reuven. And the rabbi says, Shimon, listen, Reuven has a point. You have to cut off your branches. You can't just let your branches stick into his yard. It's taking up the space. It's, it's interfering with him. He says, Rabbi, but you also have a tree. And your branches are also sticking out in the street where people walk by. You know, so what are you telling me? He says, what tree and what branches are you talking about? Go see yourself. I don't have any tree branches sticking out in the street. <laughs> well, of course, the rabbi was able to catch that on time. But otherwise, that individual would have had a very good point. You're telling me what to do. You yourself, in some ways, are, are uh, interfering with, uh, with, the, with the others right to walk, you know, without having to perhaps duck their head. Yeah, so, obviously, if you're going to give tochacha, then you want to be careful, you know, that what you say it <laughs> will, will, will be effective. Otherwise, you know, chavad, it's, it's a waste of words. The Gemara, however, adds one additional point about tochacha, and that is, lo nechrav, one of the reasons why Bet HaMikdash, the second one, was destroyed, al shelo chichu ze that the Jewish people did not admonish each other, did not rebuke each other. All right, we know there are other reasons why the Bet HaMidash was destroyed, but this is one. Whenever, by the way, you see more than one reason, they're all true. They're all acceptable, and some of them have something in common. Okay, the fact that they did not give it, rebuke each other, what does that have to do with anything? Well, it's definitely related to Sinat Hinnam, to baseless hatred. How is that related? Well, if people don't care about each other, they're definitely not going to rebuke each other. 
Let him make the mistakes he's making. Let him do what he wants. People have no interest in the other. That's part of, it's another symptom or another consequence or byproduct of baseless hatred. But the real shoresh abaya, the real root of the problem, is a lack of unity. In other words, this symptom of not rebuking, everybody minds their own business, demonstrates pilug, ba'am, it demonstrates division amongst the, the people. People have no interest, no empathy for somebody else who may be doing something completely wrong. Aren't you concerned about him? He's making mistakes. Don't you want him to have a chilek to that he should have a share to the world to come? Don't you want him to have zechuyot as well? I mean, come on, he's your brother. Don't you have an interest in him having a good life? When there is real unity, there's something called arvut, responsibility, right? We heard, kol yisrael arevin zelazeh, all the Jews are responsible for each other. They're not only responsible because we're one family, because we received the mitzvah, because it applies to all of us and we better watch each other. It's, not, it's more than that. It also means that because we're one family, we should want to, we should want to automatically care for another. It's not only something that is more or less a, a duty, that we have to be on the lookout, that we have to watch out for each other. Besides that, it's also something that should come naturally. You know, if there is real achdut, if there is real unity between two people, then there's a certain sense of responsibility. I'm responsible for him. I need to watch out for him. I need to take care of him. If somebody lets go, somebody ignores, that means he's definitely not close to him. Otherwise, how is he letting go? How is he just ignoring him? So whenever there's a true sense of unity between two individuals, husband and wife, two brothers, family members, whatever, there should be a certain sense of responsibility. And therefore, the rabbis, Chachmeh Musar, in the books on Musar, I, I write something incredible. I've seen this, I think, at least in one or two places. A good friend will occasionally rebuke you and criticize you. If you think you have a good friend, that friend never said anything negative about you, and assuming that you're in touch with each other, you can suspect that he's not a reliable good friend. He's just flattering you, full of chap lucy. <laughs> yeah, that's all. Yeah, maybe he wants your money, maybe he wants to be nice to you. If he really cared about you, he would point out your mistakes. And is there anybody that can say that he doesn't make mistakes? That he, <coughs> so the fact that he never, I'm assuming again, we're talking about two people who are in touch with each other all the time. You have good friends that live thousands of miles apart, they don't see each other, that's something else. You don't really have the chance to test that friendship if the friends are apart. They're not living in close proximity. But friends who are supposed to be very good friends, they're close friends. He's a good friend. Yeah. Has he ever said anything negative to you? Anything that you... Or was he always being nice and positive to you? He's always positive. He's never said anything negative. Then maybe he's not a good friend. He, he, does, he wants to stay close to you, and he therefore doesn't want to criticize you. He's afraid of losing your friendship, but that's not a good friend. A good friend cares about you, and if he sees you doing something wrong, he'll tell you, don't do that. That's wrong. That is not right to do it. But he's a good friend. He always hugs and kisses, and, and all of a sudden he's giving you a slap in the face. Yeah, that's the right. That's a good friend. Because he cares, he will give you that slap in the face. In other words, a criticism, not a real slap, but the criticism. Otherwise, you can suspect that this is just, uh, you, know, you know, he wants to show that he's your friend, but he's not your real friend. So this, in some ways, the Chachamah Musar considered a test, a test of friendship, of whether, how, how good of a friend is he? The rabbis take it one step further. And they say, if a rabbi of a community only has... Uh, praises from his members, nobody ever says anything negative about him, he's not doing his job. <laughs> Had he done his job right, he would have probably told some people off and made some people upset, right? And they would have said something negative about him. The fact that nobody ever said anything negative about him, it means that he's just being nice to them. And he's not pointing out their mistakes. And he's not pointing out anything that they need to correct. 
you know, their sins or whatever it is, that he's not criticizing them. Oh, then he's not doing his job. <laughs> Similar idea, yeah. For, for there to be true love and for, or for there to be an indication of that you're doing your job right, there must be some negative criticism of you. And of course, it's, it's not something that we should take too seriously, the, neg the negative criticism, depending on where it's coming from. But it should be coming <coughs> because you've done the right thing. You've said something right. You made somebody upset for something that he needs to hear. Otherwise, you're not, we're not doing our job, either as friends or as rabbis. All right. The next idea is mitrachek mina kavod. We're talking about an individual who is growing, maturing in Torah, and hopefully will be learning at some point Torah lishma, Torah for its real sake. So at some point, obviously, he will have grown so much that he has no interest in kavod. Now, no interest in kavod, there's various ways to look at it. Kavod means honor, the pursuit of honor. We know that that's not a good thing to pursue honor. So what, why is this even mentioned over here, mitrahek mina kavod? Because mitrahek is a higher level than one who's just not rodefa hara kavod. You can say, well, this guy is lo rodefa hara kavod. Oh, great, baruch Hashem. He's sincere, he wants to learn Torah for its real sake. He doesn't want titles, he doesn't want positions, he's not looking for honors or for plaques, you know. Okay, but that's called Loro Defahara Kavod. Here it says Mitrachek Mina Kavod. Mitrachek is even a higher level, it means even if he's offered, we'll give you a very well paid position with a driver and a car and all the fringe benefits, you know. They, they, they want to give him the Kavod. Mitrachek, he doesn't want it. He doesn't, he doesn't, not only does he pursue it, it's more than that. Mitrachek. Anything that can bring kavod, he shuns away from it. That's a good sign. Why is this a good sign? Because it's, kavod is incompatible with one who wants to gain proper knowledge of the Torah. Remember, Torah requires submissiveness. True Torah requires hachna'a. You want to make, a, you want to have a rabbi that you will listen to. You, you want to seek the advice of someone. Then you want to be submissive. Otherwise, you're going to do what you think is right. So in order for the Torah to influence our life, in order for us to accept direction of the Torah, there has to be submissiveness. If there is, to, if there is kavod, it interferes. Kavod not only interferes in people's life, as we say in Hebrew, it, uh, I don't know how to say that in English, it, it basically confuses them. It, uh, It makes them think or focus on themselves much more than on the real tachlit, the real agenda, the, which is the, the, the purpose of learning Torah and accepting what the Torah says, not your own opinions that may be contrary to the Torah. And some people have a problem with this, you know, not just this particular midah. They want to say that, you know, they have another opinion uh, to somebody, who, somebody else who uh, who may have given his opinion on the halakha. Now that's okay if you can compare to his level, if you can prove him wrong. If you have solid proof, then it, you can argue with another individual as long as he's more or less from the same generation or give or take a few hundred years ago. But imagine somebody trying to argue with, with the Rishonim or with the Tanaim and Amoraim, those generations, trying to second guess what they said. It takes a certain amount of arrogance to, to, to do that, because how can, you, how can we compare ourselves to that? Or complete ignorance of how great these people were. Either one, complete ignorance or ignorance, or actually both. So it's incompatible for one to be able to grow in Torah and to be able to accept what the Torah says. He cannot have any imagination even of Kabbalah. The next one is similar, He's not proud or he's not haughty in the sense that he's uh, happy with himself in how much he has accomplished. 
And the reason for that is because one who is matured in Torah, deep down he knows his true value, he knows that he doesn't know anything, he knows that the little bit he learned is just a drop in the bucket, so there's no reason like gis libo, you know, to, to be haughty or to be so self-confident with one's learning. You know, he can still make mistakes, he still needs to ask questions from others, there are things that he still doesn't know or doesn't understand well. So how could you be Megis Betalmudo if you're a real Torah scholar? Again, so this is a, a, a level that is, is understood by someone who is maturing and growing in Torah. The next one is Eno Sameach Behora'ah, which is also similar to this. He's not uh, eager and happy to give instructions to others in how, in how to follow the halakha. That's called Hora'ah. He's not so eager. Let somebody else do it. I don't want to be the one to make the decision. Somebody who's growing in Torah is always concerned maybe he'll make a mistake. Now, of course, if there's nobody else to answer the question, then you need to be the one. But if there are others, he's not the one to rush to give the decision. You know where else you can, you can see this? You can see this with Chazanim. There are some who want to pray. They want to show off their voice. There are people like that. And there are others who are more humble and say, no, even though they have a good voice, even though they know how to pray beautifully, they're not necessarily going to. If they're offered the job, maybe they'll take it. The right, the right attitude is to refuse, at least the first time. If they insist, that's something else. <laughs> but not to show that you're eager. And there are people who are not just eager, they fight over it. <laughs> that's even worse. I told you the story. There was once a, an individual who a rabbi overheard him in the Amidah, in the prayer, that he said about himself in the Amidah, I'm dust and ashes. You know, he's telling God how he's nothing, he's dust and ashes, he's so humble, you know, crying to God in his prayer. All right, wow, so the rabbi was impressed, you know, he's really making nothing of himself. When it came to the reading of the Torah, all of a sudden the rabbi sees there's a big fight between this guy and the other guy. This guy wanted the aliyah and he says, don't give it to him, I want it. So the rabbi says, but wait a minute, I just overheard you say, Anochi afar va'efer, I am dust and ash. So how could you, you know, why do you think you're better than him? He says, rabbi, I'm dust and ashes, but that guy is a zero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. That, that's not real humbleness. That, that's, what do you mean, that guy is a zero? No, a real dust and ashes means that I'm nothing, but that guy is something. That's anava. I'm nothing, and that guy is something, or is more than me. But if you say you, you're nothing, the that guy is even less. Or, you know, what? that's not humbleness. So, you know, you don't want to definitely fight for these kinds of situations. But here, the individual has matured and grown so much that he's not looking for this to be more hora'ah. In no Sameach, he's not so overjoyed to be the one to give the decision. Let somebody else do it. He's obviously careful. He doesn't want to make mistakes. He's not so eager to show off how much he knows. All right, now we're going to some other points that are, that are very important in describing an individual who is not just learning for himself, for his own gain but it's really doing it for the real reasons. One of the characteristics that will, will shine, or that should shine, will be nose be'olim chavero. Nose be'olim chavero means an individual who's actually willing to, to carry the yoke or the burden of his friend. Here we're talking about someone, we just mentioned someone who doesn't want to get involved making decisions, he's shying away from it, he doesn't want the honors. So you might think, well, he's going to stay away from being too involved in, in the social life, in, in the lives of others. So the, so the Mishnah comes back and tells us, no, 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 no. That's only when it's personal gain. But when it comes to somebody else's benefit, he actually does go out of his way to help, to carry the burden. But all means, you know, let's say that his friend has some 
he's going through a difficult time, so he comes and spends a few minutes with him and he gives him encouragement. encouragement. That's called no sebe or. He helps him out. He has no car, right? And he says, you know what, let's go shopping together or, you know, I'll help you out. You know, anything that is, that will be a help to his friend in his time of need is called no sebe or. He identifies with him during his time of need. He somehow lends him a hand either uh, in an emotional way or in a physical way. So even though here he's, he's staying away, but when it comes to helping others, when it, com when it comes to being involved with the tzibur, with the, the community, he does. He does share, he does give of himself to carry the burden of others. Machri'ol lechav zechut. Actually, before we go to Machri'ol lechav zechut, let me give you, let me share with you a story I saw a very interesting story of how you, you have somebody who may be very uh, to himself, in other words, he doesn't want kavod. Nonetheless, he's willing to put down his kavod for the help of others, which is the exact opposite. In other words, okay, you don't want the kavod, but would a person put down his honor, his dignity? That, not everybody would want to do that. So there was once a, a rabbi who went around collecting money from the community. And everybody thought that he was collecting for himself, that he needed for his parnasah. They helped him out, they gave him money. He didn't need the money for himself. He had enough to live off. He took that money to distribute to the poor. Why? Because that community, for some reason, was not helping out the poor. So he says, how do I accomplish that? They don't want to help the poor. He said, I would rather embarrass myself and let them think that I need it for myself, but at least I can give money to, to the poor. So look what he was willing to do. He was willing to lower his kavod in order to be able to give tzedakah to the poor because they were not doing it. So he let them think that he was collecting for himself because for that he did help him. Thank God for that he did. But look what he went to, to, what, to, to, you know, to what extent he, he, he did what he did. Yes. In the Perky Albert, actually, Rabbi mentions that when people steal from the poor, they don't get the tithe for the poor. Right. Right there. When the rabbi gave on behalf of the community, yeah. would it cover them or would it not cover them? As far as the punishment that comes, it talks about the years, the different years after Sukkot right. will come, in the third year, in the fourth year. They don't have the same credit. So they, they, were, they were giving money indirectly to the poor. So they have some credit because the poor were supported by that money. Okay. But that was not the same as had they given it directly for that purpose. So would they be liable for the punishments? No, 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 it's not a punishment. No, no, no. Imagine the perky outlook about the different punishments that come if it's... Uh, uh, oh, no, no, no. The, the, money, the poor received what they needed. They were supported properly. So, so the poor got their money. It's just that these people did not fulfill the mitzvah 100% the way they could have, and they would have been rewarded more, more immensely had they done it with the right uh, uh, mindset, with the right kavanah, the right intention. So here, somehow he got them to perform the mitzvah, but it's not the same as if doing it, you know, directly giving it to the poor man and encouraging him. First of all, anybody in that community that gave money only to the rabbi, not to the poor, never learned to open up his heart to the poor as a result. Because remember, tzedakah does two things. Not only do you get a mitzvah, not only does it help the poor, it actually opens your heart. Especially those who are stingy by nature, it gets them used to. But toach tiftach et yadecha, open your arm, your hand. So here, they were thinking, oh, they're just helping the rabbi out. So they never really had a chance to open up and to empathize with the poor and to, you know, to hear their stories. So they lost out a lot by not doing that that would, way. Would they be liable for the punishment? No, there's no punishment. No, it mentions the punishment. No, know. but what punishment? They, the, the money actually went to the poor. But if they say that the rabbi didn't do it? What do you mean the rabbi? Say the rabbi didn't take on himself to give to the poor. The All right. In the, in, in the, in well, the obviously, house. yeah. If they didn't give, then they didn't give. That, that would be an issue. It would be a big issue. So he saved them. From, he saved them. Exactly. The right. He saved them. There's a story. There's a story in the Gemara 
with one of the Tanaim who went, who had a dream that uh, the government was going to take, the, imagine the IRS or the auditors, whatever, they were going to take a whole bunch of money from, uh, from his nephews. And he immediately got them to contribute to a cause. Immediately to a cause of tzedakah. And as a result of that mitzvah, the government did not take all that money that they were, were going to, they took a little bit less. So the ra rabbi told his nephews, I saved you because that money almost went to the government. He says, oh, you, should have done, you should have told us that about all the money because they still lost some money. Okay, then why didn't you tell us about all of it, you know? Thank God you saved us that some of that money we were able to give to a good cause instead of giving it to, you know, away. Well, the point is, I, th I believe he said, is that you have to do it on your own. You know, I was able to save you partially some of that money, but you have to do the mitzvah on your own too. Otherwise, you know, it doesn't really count as much. Yeah. So that's it's a s similar idea here. All right, so the next point is machri'o lechav zechut. Machri'o lechav zechut, very important idea that uh, is significant you know, in other areas of life too, not just here in the list of, of levels, that an individual who is is willing to carry the burden of his friend is also, or should be also, capable of giving the benefit of the doubt or judging favorably another individual. In other words, because what are we talking about here? We're talking about the chpatiyut. We're talking about a level of, of interest that one has in the other, not in himself. Here you have an, a, an incredible achiever. Yes, but don't think he's only thinking of himself. He's also so well refined, the Torah has refined him, to the point of where he is caring of others. Or Hevet Abriyot, who said last week, he loves people. He cares about them. He's willing to correct their mistakes. And now, we're going to the next step. He's also judging them favorably. If they made a mistake, he says, well, I guess they didn't know better. That's a very important idea because it's very easy for somebody who's not as smart as you, for you to, who, who is smarter, to look down at him. That's normal. That's human nature. The haham, the wise man, may easily look down at the one who's not so intelligent. You know, had he learned, you know, he would have known better. Don't, don't, don't think that way. Feel bad for him that he has not, uh, uh, does not have your experience or your knowledge. So that's what Machriol Lechav Zechut means, that this individual is so well behaved that he is also uh, giving the benefit of the doubt and judging everybody favorably. The next one is Ma'amido Al Ha'emet. Ma'amido Al Ha'emet could also be either for himself or for another individual that he shows him the right path. If it's talking about another individual, Mamidol Ahmed means that he not only points out his mistakes. A lot of people have it easy, you know, or, or like the easy way. You're wrong. This is not right. You're mistaken. You know, it's very easy to point out the mistakes. Okay, fine. All right. Can you show me the right, the right way to do it? That they don't do. Not everybody will will take the next step and say, you know what, I really care about you. Now let me show you how to do it right. You know? Dinner is awful. You know, somebody, you know, somebody might say that to his spouse. It's no good. You know? Could you make a suggestion on how to improve it? <laughs> Instead of just commenting on the negative, perhaps show what, what could be done to improve it. You know how important that is? That will show that you care about the person, you know. Well, first of all, you have to be careful on how to, not to make such a negative comment. It's awful, you know, to be a little bit more tactful. But if you did make a negative comment, a little bit, a little bit of negative, then at least point out, well, can you show me how to correct it? You know, in either the says it's nishkan kunz, you know, it, it's, it's not, the law of it's it's not such a big deal it's easy to point out that something is not right. Yeah, but can you 
if you don't know how to fix it, then why are you telling me it's wrong? Just it's better not to say anything. So, mamido al haemet is a very interesting point here. In that it's it's not enough that you tell him, you give him usar where he's wrong. You show him the right way. Mamido al haemet it can also be referring to the individual himself who's who's growing in Torah. That the Torah itself will give him the proper direction and show him the emet the truth. It will give him clarity. Ma'amidu ala shalom. Also a very beautiful idea. What happens in the end, basically we're, we're almost at the end. So this level, ma'amidu ala shalom, is telling us, you know what the Torah will do for an individual? It will show him that shalom is worth pursuing at all costs. Ma'amidu ala shalom means that this individual will never care to fight unless it's the Shem Shammai for the sake of God, of course. He says, why, why, why fight? Why argue? Let's try to compromise. Let's try to make peace between a husband and wife. He will always want to pursue Shalom. Or have Shalom like we've covered in the past, the students of Aharon. This is something that will be so ingrained in him, so important to him. Something that he will pursue. Ma'amidu ala shalom. Let's not, uh, you know, uh, argue about this too much. He led the Shammai, the rabbis tell us, as much as they fought and they argued and they had various disagreements, nevertheless, they married each other. There was shalom between them, there was peace. You know, and that's very tricky when you have two groups in a community who are very opposed to each other. They have different world views. They're both orthodox, but different world views. For them to get along, to invite each other, it's tricky, you know, because the Yetzer Araf foments the, the division, and they know we have nothing to do with them, but, you know, they're your brothers and sisters. So, ma Torah, in, in the high level, Ma'amido ala shalom. It basically shows him the correct way. You know, even if you disagree, you still make peace with him. Mityashev li bo For those of you who remember, from one of the first levels was bi yeshuv. And that yeshuv was yeshuv adat. When one wants to learn Torah, he needs to have peace of mind. He needs to do it calmly. He can't rush through it. That is what, how one acquires Torah. So that's called Yeshuv. Mityashev is different. Mityashev means that he gains clarity uh, of, of the issues, of the subject matter. And that's a very, very high level when, when, when an individual has clarity of the, of the subject. It, where initially Yeshuv meant this is the method on how to learn. You want to be calm, you want to be focused, you don't want to be thinking about your, the stocks while you're learning Torah. That's called Yishu, peace of mind. Mityashev v'talmudo is more of, a, of what has been accomplished as a result of learning and growing and learning, is that at some point he is completely composed. That's the word in English, completely composed. You ask him a question, he doesn't have to think too, much, too hard about it. He's able to answer it. He's able to get to the point. He's able to relate to it. That's a very, very high level if one has gained that. A lot of people have a good memory, but they're not necessarily composed. It's not necessarily, they don't necessarily have the clarity. Just like some people know a lot, but they don't know how to give it over to others. That also takes a certain talent. And being able to explain a difficult subject and trying to condense it or to give it over to others, not everybody's capable of doing that. So here it's talking about somebody who has gained clarity in his learning. The next is Sho'elu Meshiv. Sho'elu Meshiv means that he is, he knows when to ask, what to ask, and how to respond. This is something that we've covered in the past, that these are one of the qualities of a chacham, of a wise man. He knows when to ask a question, when to raise a question, and when to answer the question. There are people who ask questions of completely different subject that has nothing to do with what is being discussed. That is not the quality of the Chacham. So Sho'el Meshiv shows order in the mind. 
Shomea Mosif means that he continues to hear what others have to say so he can increase his learning. A lot of people will say, oh, I'm stopping here, I know enough. No, as we said before, such an individual who's interested in growing and learning knows that it's a never ending uh, pursuit. So he's always willing to listen to what others have to say. Others may know something he does not know. Umosif and he continues to add to his learning by hearing what others have to say. Halomed al menat al lamed, he learns with the intent of teaching. That's that's also beautiful. He's not learning for himself. He wants to share it with others. This is a, an important idea because a lot of people. Uh, are able to give, as we just said, are able to give it over to others, so why just hold it for yourself if you can share it with others? But I've seen it. I've seen it in real life where some people have done a lot of research, a lot of hard work, and they don't just want to give it over to somebody else or to share it. Now, I understand that partially they don't want somebody to take all the credit for what they've done, you know, and not mention their name, perhaps. but. If you're really learning at Lishem Shamaim, you should not care to share what you have with others. Give it over to them. You know, what, because ultimately you want to disseminate this. You don't want to keep it for yourself. So Halomed al Menat al Lamed is a higher, more shalem way of learning than to just learn it for yourself. Learn with the intent of sharing what you've learned with others. The next one, however, is very, very relevant, and that is halomed al menat la'asot. That applies to everyone. When we learn Torah, we're not just learning it to gain raw knowledge of the information, but we want to learn in order that we should fulfill what it says. That is, the tachlit of learning is to do. The rabbis tell us, lo'a talmud ha'ikaro ela ma'aseh. Learning is not the goal, it's the doing. Uh, Judaism is a religion of deeds. You can't just know th certain things, learn about them, and not do them. As the rabbis tell us in the Gemara, Amar Rabbi Yitzchak, it says in the Torah, Ki karov davar meod asoto. The words of the Torah are very close to you, in your mouth and your heart, to fulfill them. So Rabbi Yitzchak says, to whom is it close? To whoever befiv ubilvavo asoto. To whoever intends to fulfill it. To whoever intends to fulfill it, then the words of the Torah will come easy to him and he will be able to, to go ahead and accomplish it. Hashem will, of course, assist him in that. But there are people who learn Torah just out of curiosity, just like any, you know, learning about the heritage of any other nation, learning it, treating it as just another book of, of history. And then, of course, the Torah will not have the same impact on, a, on, on that individual. It's still better than nothing, but it's not the same. Because if you're Jewish, then the, the whole purpose of the Torah is not a history book. It's la asoto, it's to fulfill what it says. You know? There's a whole demonstration now at the Kotel these days with the women who are trying to put on tefillin there. Nothing wrong with a woman putting on tefillin in your, in your own home. In public, it's not done because it's just not the tradition that we have that women put on tefillin in public. But that's right. Now, what's the problem nonetheless of allowing them? Well, it's a hypocrisy. It's not only confrontational, what they're doing, but it's very hypocritical. These women who are putting on tefillin are not observant of Shabbat or Kashrut or anything else. What are you doing then? You're, you're inventing a new religion. That's the problem here. You see, if these were all religious women, they say, we want to put on tefillin too. The rabbis will say, okay, I guess you're such tzaddikot, you're so righteous that you also want to put on tefillin. Okay, then you got to get up for nets, minyan, first. <laughs> <laughs> and before you go there, maybe go to the tevila. Right? <laughs> all right, and then we'll let you put on tefillin and tzitzit. Two for the price of one. <laughs> but yeah, what, what, are you, what are you coming for? You know, these, these other women who are not religious, what are you coming, what are you putting on Tiffany for? No, just to show that we have equal rights like the men do. You know, so it's, it's all confrontational. It's not sincere. <clears throat> 
it's not motivated for the real reason. It's a reformist form of, of looking at things. It's not part of our tradition. It's a new religion. Why, why should we tolerate it? Why, why make this, you're making fun of it, and you're starting up a fight, <laughs> you know. So it, and, and it's disrespectful. So it's you know, people don't realize that it's not that we don't want it or don't like it or don't tolerate it. No, we, it's possible to tolerate it. It depends what, what, where it's coming from. From somebody who's totally not religious to to want to do something like that. That's not right. So alomed al menat la asot. Ultimately, the, the, the learning is for this purpose. It has to be in order to be able to fulfill the mitzvot. That is why we learn Torah. Why is it so important? Well, imagine somebody learning medicine. There's two guys learning medicine. One is learning medicine because he just wants to know medicine. That's all. He's learning it because he wants to be knowledgeable. Another one is learning medicine because he wants to help cure people. What's going to be the difference between the two? The one who's learning just because he wants to learn, he will not mind if he makes a mistake. He will not mind if he didn't cover every detail. He will not mind if he doesn't know everything. The one who's learning to help people, he's definitely going to be a lot more careful. He's going to be more, you know, cautious about mistakes, about what he learns. He's helping people, he can't afford to make mistakes. So the same is true when one learns in order to do, it's very, very different than just learning because he wants to be learned and just know it. He won't care as much about it. <coughs> when you're learning because you know you've got to do this, you're going, to be, you're, going to, you're going to be more careful with your learning. Hamachkimet Rabo. This individual who is elevating himself level after level in Torah also has an interest in making his teacher more of a chacham. That's interesting. In order to properly understand Mahkim et Rabo, you have to go to the Gemara that, ha that has a discussion of this, uh, of a similar uh, episode with Rabbi Yochanan and Rish Lakish. Rabbi Yochanan was the teacher, Rish Lakish was the student, but Rish Lakish was so sharp, so astute, that he always, any time his, his teacher said something new or something different or something interesting, Resh Lakish would, would object with 24 objections. He says, I'll tell you in 24 ways or 24 reasons why you're wrong. And guess what? His rabbi, his teacher loved it because it made him reanalyze what he said. It made him make sure 100% that he was able to prove what he said. He preferred that student over another student who says, Rabbi, you're right, great idea. I accept whatever you say, because I don't like you. <laughs> Why not? No, I want the one that says, you're wrong. <laughs> Doesn't make sense. I'll prove it to you in 24 ways. That's the student he liked. That, that was Rish Lakish, and he felt terrible when Rish Lakish passed away. They say he even, he even died as a result of all the agony, the pain of not having him around anymore. He, he missed him so much, because that is what increased his learning. That is what pushed him to greater heights, to be able to, to figure out things in a better way than, than, a, than a student telling him, Rabbi, this, this, this is a great idea. I didn't think of it. You know, wow, it makes so much sense. What do you mean it makes sense? You have no, nothing to say about it? You don't, you're not going to argue about it? Yeah. A mahkim et rabo means that he, his intent is that his teacher should come out ahead too by asking him the questions by by arguing with him, arguing, of course, for the sake of, of learning. Also very important, remember we're dealing with a very critical time in Jewish history of where the Masoret, the tradition is coming down generation after generation and only barely now being written down in the, in the written, in the oral, the oral Torah, in the Mishnah. So we need to make sure that we, one who's teaching it is mechavenet shmuato. He's able to properly attest 
how he knows what he knows, where he learned it from, who is the one that told us to him. That's called Mechaven Shumato. You want to you want to be accurate in the transmission, and that leads us to the next point: How Omer Davar B'Shem Omro, and that you want to make sure you say it in the name of whoever said it before. That's why in the Gemara you will see this rabbi said it in the name of this rabbi, in the name of that rabbi. Many many times all over the place you will see that uh, syntax, that kind of uh, of quote quoting the one who said it, but in the name of who he said it. We want to know where he learned it from, who his teacher was, where he got it from. You see how the rabbis were so careful in the transmission. They didn't just make up a story. They didn't just say it on their own. Unless, of course, they were able to say, I learned it from this pasuk, this is the interpretation, this is the way I see it. Otherwise, they always were careful to say where they learned it from and who is the first one that said it. But it's not only for transmission purposes, it's also to give credit where credit is due. Otherwise, you're stealing. I forget the word in English. There's a word in English. Plagiarism. Yeah, very good. I guess you're learning law. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Right. Right? Yeah, I picked up on what is that? ESP, I picked up on Yeah, yeah, OK. No, that only, if you know, only if you're in that uh, realm of law, perhaps, or you read a lot, but it is plagiarism. For those of you who've never heard of it, it's to it's to write. Imagine you're writing a book; somebody else wrote it, and you put your name on it. And there are people who would do that. Why not take all the credit yourself? That is why there is today uh, a patent, and uh, you know, and all these other things, safeguards, copyright, exactly. And the Chinese are still copying it. <laughs> you know. All the all the software piracy, you know. I, I just signed the news. Somebody was caught, made millions of dollars with thousands and thousands of copies of software that he was selling for cheap. You know. So this is not only to avoid gezel, not only to avoid stealing somebody else's credit, but halamata. There's something else over here. This is a very interesting. Whoever says something in the name of the one who originally said it brings redemption or salvation to the world. Esther told King Achashverosh in the name of Mordechai. She told him of the plot against him, that Big Tan Bateresh were going to assassinate him. She could have said it, you know what, I just found out something. Who told you? A little birdie. She could have said something else, right? No, she said, she said Mordechai. And as a result of that, Mordechai was later recalled, remembered, and you know, brought into the, the royal court and became appointed. And the Geula for Am Yisrael for the Jewish nation came by as a result of Esther mentioning the, the one who should get the credit for it. And that is Mordechai. Yes? The Rambam never mentioned any of these sources. So a lot of people were upset with it. The That's Rabid right. And other people were. Very good, very good question, very good point. A lot of halakhic authorities were upset at the Rambam for not bringing sources. So because of that, Baruch Hashem, the various commentaries took it to task to try as best as possible to point <laughs> out the sources of where the Rambam took it, and they, they basically got the majority. The Rambam said some things on his own. The Rambam did formulate his own opinion based on lack of conclusion of certain halachot in the Gemara. And basically took it from the various uh, opinions that he had from his teachers or several teachers together, similar to what the Bet Yosef did in the Shulchan Aruch. Uh, nonetheless, why he did not do it, you know, there's several <coughs> explanations of why he did not do that. It, it wasn't easy. As it is, it's, it's, it's an incredible masterpiece what he did. You know, to take halachot that concern all areas of Torah, not just the relevant halachot, all areas of Torah, that are basically he had to compile uh, from various sources. And it could be that he did not have, in those days, all the kitveyad, all the manuscripts in front of him. You know, uh, in, order, in order, of course, to do what he did, he had to have a large amount of, of sources, of books. And nonetheless, uh, 
it could also be that uh, he did not want to open up a Pandora box and say, oh, why did you choose to follow the halakha like him? Well, he opened up a different Pandora box by not mentioning anything at all. So the, re the, the truth is, you're right. It, it would have been better at least to quote as much as possible uh, you know, the, the sources for people to be able to look it up. And, uh, and this would have helped others to even today to learn and to try to figure out where, why the Rambam is saying what he's saying. Okay. So uh, uh, another way of looking at it is that Hashem left that to, to other authors and to other commentators to fill in where, just like the Ramah was filling in for the Mechaber Shulchan Aruch, what the Ashkenaz custom is. You know, he did his part, he did his part. So Baruch Hashem, today at least, uh, the, the, the composition is more or less complete. All right, we have just one Mishnah left for today. Uh, but before we go to the last Mishnah, just to finish up on this point, so we said how important it is to give over where you know something from, especially when you're dealing with an accurate transmission. Oh, what's the source? What if the person passed away? If the person is no longer alive, the rabbis tell us in the Gemara, if you say something in his name, siftotav dovevot bakever, his lips will move in the grave. It's a tremendous credit to the neshama. As the rabbis tell us, the neshamot of the tzaddikim don't have monuments that speak of their deeds in this world. Monuments? What is a monument? Headstone. You see a headstone, what does it say? It says nothing. What are the real monuments of the tzaddikim? Their deeds their words. We have all their words today, all the Mishnayot, all the Halachot, all that they have written, if, if, if it's around. It's a tremendous zechut for the Niftar that it's still being learned. So therefore, when somebody quotes the author the, and mentions the words and mentions who said those words, it's a tremendous credit to the Niftar, even though he's already passed away. So perhaps that also could be a meaning, Mevi Geulah Laolam trying to understand, well, how does this bring a redemption to the world? They brought redemption back then with the Stenem Mordechai. We see how powerful it was. Okay, that's a good example, but in reality, it brings another form of Geulah or Yeshua by helping even those who have already passed away, by the, the lips moving the Kepa. In other words, it, it is in a credit to them, even though after they've passed away. So by us mentioning their name, it's a form of Geulah. It helps those of us who are alive, plus it helps those who have left this world. So perhaps that's also called a form of geula. It helps them. It elevates them. It, it's a credit in, in their, in a, you know, to their name. Mishnah Zayin, which is in some way is a summary of what we've just covered, in telling us how great the Torah is. G'dolah Torah shinotenet chaim le'osea. The Torah is so great that it gives life to those who fulfill it. So pay attention. The commentaries explain. It says oseha and not lomdeha. It doesn't say those who learn, those who do it, those who fulfill it. And it does so So Torah is, is of great value because we gain from it in Olam Azeh and in Olam Abba, as we say every morning in the prayer. There are certain mitzvot, including Talmud Torah, Keneged Kulam, that one eats from the fruit in this world, and it was that one derives some benefit from Torah even in this world. Because the Torah protects us from sin, the Torah protects us from the Yetzirah, the Torah therefore gives us tremendous benefits in this world, plus all the benefit that is still waiting for us in Olam Abba. As the Pasuk says, Ki hayim hem it is a life for those who find it, for those who acquire it. Pasuk to all flesh it is a healing, which I'll explain in a moment. It's another pasuk there that it is a healing or a remedy for the physical body, plus like marrow to the bones. In other words, somehow it helps the physical body, plus it helps the nefesh. What's the difference? The physical body has a yetzerara, has an evil inclination that is always being tested and challenged, and the Torah cools it off. So one who learns Torah has a better chance of doing battle with the Yetzirah. One who is depressed and going through a difficult time 
the Torah misamahat oto, the Torah will gladden his heart, the Torah will, give, will, will raise his spirits, will make him more uh, optimistic, will give him hope. All of that is physical. How, is it, how does it work with the, ne- with the nefesh, with the yetzerah? Well, obviously, it, as we said, it cools him off, it, it reminds him of his day of death, it reminds him of his ultimate tachlit, of his ultimate purpose and mission in life, so he doesn't get himself into trouble, so he stays focused on what he needs to do. So ultimately, it's, it's a tremendous, has tremendous healing uh, attributes. As the rabbis tell us, it's a tavlin, it's an antidote to the Yetzirah. And therefore, we came from it in both in Olam Azay and Olam Abba. However, the big question is, and that's how the second half of the Mishnah helps us, is what about those who don't learn? What about those who don't know how to learn? Those who don't have as much time to learn? So the truth is that even a few minutes a day of Musar is a tremendous help. We've made this point many, many times. It would be a shame for a person not to spend a few minutes every day because so much can be gained. After he leaves this world, they'll show him upstairs what those 50 minutes would have done for him. He would have been a different individual had he known this little bit of Torah. He would have behaved differently. He would have been more honest in his business dealings. He wouldn't have been so distressed. So everybody can learn a little bit, but for those who can't learn that much, it says, It will be a, a, a life, a tree of life, for those who support it, those who hold on to it, will be fortunate. And there was even those who don't learn, but who supported Torah, who paid scholars to learn Torah, who supported the yeshivot. All the supporters will also be held in high regard, and they will also have tremendous credit, sachar, reward for their support of Torah. So those who couldn't can do what Yisachar and Zevulun did, the two brothers who had a, a relationship of where Issachar learned Torah and Zebulun traveled the seas on business. And he supported his brother. So he shared in his brother's Torah and Issachar, who was learning Torah, was, was supported through Zebulun. So it is possible to gain tremendous reward in supporting Torah as well. And finally, the, the continuation of the Pasuk says, Vomer ki hem which is very interesting. Shlomo Melech says, you know what, the Torah is like jewelry. It will be like, like Livyat hen, like a garland, I think they call it in English, to your head, and anakim, and like a, a necklace to your throat. What's that have to do with anything? So I saw one commentary say, that the Torah has two ways of expressing itself. One through the head, you know, by learning and teaching, and one through the voice, by talking about it, which is also teaching. So that's gargerot, is the voice, the throat, and the rosh is, of course, the mind and the learning. And why is it a garland? Because in the end, all the learning that we'll do will also beautify us and, and the goyim will look up to us, as the pasuk says, The goyim will admire you. The Torah has always been a source of admiration for us. The tremendous chokhmah that's in the Torah, the tremendous uh, advice. Look at all the non-Jewish uh, cultures, how much they borrowed from it in the U.S. Constitution. So this will be a liviat chen. People think, ah. Oh, being a rabbi, being a scholar, doesn't bring any kavod. A fuch, it brings tremendous kavod. It brings tremendous honors to you. In other words, it will ultimately give you tremendous kavod. It will give you a long length of life on the left and on the right and on the left. Osher kavod, tremendous riches and honor. Now, what kind of orach yamin are we talking about? What kind of length of life are we talking about? There was once a famous rabbi who lived not too long ago. His name was Rabbi Yisrael Zalman Meltzer. He was the father-in-law of Aaron Kotler. When he was getting married, the, the, the girl's side of the family was very concerned because he was a sick man. He was a very unhealthy young, young individual. And uh, they didn't know what to do, but he was a very learned man. He was a pious man. He was a really good man, but he was not healthy. So they went to the Chafetz Chaim. And listen to what the Chafetz Chaim said. What would the Chafetz Chaim say? 
it was clear he wasn't healthy. Man, you want to marry somebody un unhealthy? So the Chafetz Chaim says, listen, there are some people who aren't healthy, and there are some people who have a long life. Did you, did you, did you understand what he said? There are some people who are unhealthy, and there are some people who have a long life. What does that mean? In other words, it's possible for him that despite his illness, he will be living a long life. And you know what happened? He lived to the age of 84. Baruch Hashem. In other words, it's not, in other words, don't think just because he's ill. He, there are people who are ill and will not make it. But there are people who have a long life. You know, and that's more important than anything else. Obviously, we want it to be a, a, a quality life, but in this case, he was worthy of it. You know, of, of you know, getting married, of course, into this family that everybody wanted him, and he turned out to be, of course, a, a very big rabbi. So even though everybody was unsure how long he was going to live, he ended up living till the age of 84. Okay, just to finish up, the last pasuk tells us, doesn't say it over here, but not only will it give you a long life, its ways are, are, the, are ways of peace, and it will only increase your peace. Ultimately, the mitzvot have always proven to be beautiful, beautiful examples of how to live a life there are many, many difficulties in life, many challenges in life, and those who have followed the mitzvot have never failed. The Torah has always guided them to do the proper thing, to be able to survive no matter what the challenges were. Because the Torah shows us the proper way. The Torah's ways are, shalom, are of peace. Whereas other people, psychologists and experts and other, other individuals who've had to guide people in how to live their lives were not necessarily successful in what they did because their methods is not necessarily proven and even if it's proven it cannot necessarily apply to every human being. The Torah applies to every one of us. And that is why it's, it's a, such a valuable asset that we have. And in the, in the life that we're living if, in the 21st century today there's so many storms out there it's imagine a big, a big sea, a big ocean, and it's very stormy and many challenges abound. The only thing that we can do is to hold on to that floating log. Why do I say floating log? Because we're talking about an etz chaim he. It's, it's a tree. It's a log. To be able to swim, it's very difficult. How long can you swim for in the ocean? Even if you're a professional swimmer, no matter how great you are, you know, people are challenged. There are many, many trials. People break down. People are going through financial crises. There's all kinds of things happening. So it, it reminds us, if you hold on to the Torah, to, the, to this log that's floating in the water in the stormy seas, this you will be able to survive. This is the only way to survive. Just like the rabbis tell us about Shabbat, more than what we observed and kept and guarded Shabbat, the Shabbat protected and guarded us. More than what we did for the Shabbat, the Shabbat did for us. So, in the same way, if a Jew takes care of the Torah, the Torah will take care of him. The Torah will safeguard him. And this is very, very powerful because I, I see it every day and it, and it really pains me. There are a lot of Jews who are so far, so distant, who come from good, normal families. They started off okay, but they've drifted away. And you say to yourself, you know, are they ever going to come back? Do they have a chance? The, the, it's wild out there. It's really it's very, very wild. There's so many temptations out there between the TV and the internet. And, oy, boy, boy, what is a, a young man or woman going to do to be able to survive spiritually? It's, it's, it's uh, frightening. I'm talking about that they started off with, from a good home. Forget about even those who don't know anything. What's going to be? We have to get them close to the Torah. That's the only, somehow getting back to hold on to the Torah. Once they see it, 
and they grab onto it, they have to grab onto it. If one, you throw him a life, a, a, what do you call those things? Life a lifesaver? Life preserver. Life preserver, those, right, those little things. Mm -hmm. He says, I don't want it. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, well, well, we can't do anything about it. You know? Same thing with people who are sick, you know, giving give the medication. I don't want to take medication. It's the same thing. You know, if somebody doesn't want it, there's, there's very little we can do. But hopefully, as we said before, with the, with the right attitude and the patience and the, and, the, and, ca and the care that we should have for each other, you know, maybe one of these days they'll awaken and grab onto before it's too late. Therefore, never say it's too late, never, never give up on anyone. People have been very far away doing yoga in the Himalayas and <laughs> they've come back, you know, even though they had tattoos all over and they had earrings on the nose and the toes and, the f and everywhere you can imagine. You know, with a cuckoo, you know, long hair. I've seen it all. That, in some ways, in, is inspiring because it tells you if those guys can come back, then anybody could come back. So, what has it? What has it? And what can do it? The Torah, as the Orach Haim Hakadosh says, when we left Egypt, we had to leave right away. Because had we waited a little bit longer, we would have fallen to the fiftieth level of Tuma and never have come out of it. 50th level of Tumah is, is the level of heresy. Today, Orach Haim HaKadosh says, in the day in the generation of Mashiach, the generation will fall to the lowest depth, the level of the, the 50th level of Tumah, but they will come out of it. How? Because now we have something our forefathers didn't have. We have the Torah. We received it. They didn't have it, so the Hashem had to take them out right away. We have it today. If a Jew holds on to the Etz Haim Hila Machazim Kimba Hashem, he will be able to survive. I mean. <laughs>